I'm my own McGinty from San Antonio, Texas, and I'm an advocate for my friend Patrick Davis, who is a victim of guardianship abuse. Patrick and I went to high school together in San Antonio. His senior year in January of 1980, Patrick was involved in an automobile accident in what they term a Smokey and the Bandit Trans Am. Patrick was a passenger in the car and he was uh, in a coma for uh, almost 10 months. When he woke up, he was paralyzed on his left side. Um, Patrick uh, and his dad initiated a, a lawsuit, or should I say uh, a team of lawyers, uh, got on their side to initiate a lawsuit against GM and uh, the Smokey and the Bandit movie and Smokey and the Bandit Trans Am. 1984, in August of 1984, um, the $50 million lawsuit was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount of money. Pat was supposed to get his own home, private care, private transportation, and rehabilitation. And what has happened to Patrick is quite the opposite. Pat was uh, left in a nursing home. Uh, all of his money went into a uh, living trust. Uh, Pat was put on Medicaid and SSI. People always ask me about, well, what about Pat's family? And I have come to find out, uh, you know, when you're in high school, you really just assume everybody has a mom and dad who love them and takes care of them. But I found out the, quite the opposite, that Pat came from a very dysfunctional family, uh, an abusive father, uh, and his mother had fled for her life many years before. So Pat didn't have anybody to watch over him. Uh, finally, I uh, found out that in 1990, Pat had been sent to a rehabilitation at, um, in Tyler, Texas, New Medico Rehab Facility, where he was getting, finally getting some rehabilitation, speech, OT, and PT. Meanwhile, uh, another former classmate named Mark Daney, his mother, Mrs. Daney, went to one of Pat's doctors, Dr. Donald Curry, and said, uh, I cannot find my son, can you help me? So this was before the HIPAA laws and Dr. Curry thought that this was Pat's mother. She had explained that she had adopted Pat, which was not the truth. And uh, once they located Pat, she said she would like him to come back to San Antonio. So Dr. Curry had him transferred back to San Antonio in early 1991, and he was put in a nursing home. And then uh, Mrs. Daney talked her son, Mark Daney, into uh, trying to get guardianship over Pat. And so the first uh, thing I found in the court documents was that in 1984, the court had been motioned to uh, provide a guardian of the estate for Pat because he was deemed a person of unsound mind. But they decided not to go that route, and instead they created this living trust for Pat and Pat signed his own trust agreement and his signature was notarized. Now, uh, I had been trying to find Pat for, for at least 10 years, and uh, thank God for Facebook, a girl on Facebook sent me a message that she used to be a nurse at the facility where Pat is currently residing. She sent me a message, and we talked on the phone, and she let me know that uh, Pat was being uh, hidden at this facility. He has at a state-regulated or state-licensed ICFMR, which stands for In Immediate Care Facility for the Mentally Retarded. It's called Mission Road Developmental Center. It is basically a last stop before a state uh, facility. And Pat is in a home on their campus on the south side of San Antonio with seven other individuals. Uh, most all of them are uh, intellectually disabled or mentally retarded. Uh, intellectually disabled is the new term. Uh, 
Four of them are nonverbal women. And uh, so he's not even being housed or living with people of his similar in, in, injury. Pat is paralyzed on his left side. And his cognitive impairment basically is that he remembers everything. It just usually takes him a lot longer for it to get out of his brain. And he'll even tell you it takes him a while. And um, Pat remembered me just immediately on the phone when I was first allowed to talk to him. He said, oh, yeah, Bourgeois, which is my maiden name, I remember you, and you were very quiet. And uh, Pat had been a very popular high school football player, blonde hair, blue eyes. Everybody knew who Pat was. And so this accident really impacted the whole high school, especially even the younger players on the football team. And once I, I was allowed to visit Pat, um, the first night his aide there that night began to divulge a lot of information to me. She told me that Pat's legal guardian, Mark Daney, only came to see Pat once a year at the mandatory visit, and that no one ever no one else ever came to visit Pat and I that just really hit me as odd knowing that he had been on a football team where were his teammates where were other people from the high school and um, I thought well if nobody is going to visit Pat our family will um, I have uh, six children uh, one of them is a special needs child and uh, so our whole family went down to visit Pat and then uh, Pat would ask me to bring my two youngest ones, especially. He enjoyed watching them on the playground at the facility. Well, I started to get the feeling that the house manager was not happy with me being there. And my phone calls to Pat started not being uh, answered whenever I would call his home, the, the group home. Uh, they would not answer. I would leave messages. Pat was never allowed to call me back. And uh, I got a call from the facility that I could no longer visit Pat. And the reason given was that I had to become a volunteer of the facility in order to visit him, which I thought was really odd and strange. But I didn't want to do that. But I went ahead and complied, went through their background check, their references because I wanted to visit Pat. My family wanted to visit him, and he wanted visitors. So I went through that, and then uh, I got to visit him one more time with my kids after becoming, quote, a volunteer at this facility. And the second time, before the second time I was going to go visit him, I got a call from this house manager, Debbie Flores. And she told me that I could no longer bring my kids because I was not watching Pat. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's not my job to, to watch Pat. You know, my, I'm just there to visit. But anyway, she called me on a Saturday night. And my scheduled visit was for Sunday morning, May 23rd, 2010. I went to my, my visit with Pat, and I was... He was obviously over-medicated at that visit compared to my other visits. I brought my camera with me, and I did record him at this, this time. I asked him some questions, and uh, he was just, he was really out of it. He was falling asleep. I came at 10 o'clock. My time to visit was 10 to 12. 10 o'clock, he was just falling asleep by uh, he kept asking me to just take him back to the house because he wanted to go lay down. And um, I, I joked with him one time, well, Pat, you want to arm wrestle, just trying to stimulate him to keep him awake. So we did that. I ended up taking him back to his group home at 1130. He, they sat him up at the table to eat, and I observed him trying to feed himself, but he repeatedly kept falling asleep while he was trying to eat. Meanwhile, one of the ladies who, who was there taking care of him, named Linda, 
told me, uh, Ione, we don't mean to be rude to you when you call and you want to talk to Pat, but Debbie tells us not to let you talk to him, and that makes Pat very angry. Well, so after this incident and her telling me that Pat's not allowed to uh, talk on the phone, another girl there let me know, named Sarah, that Pat is not even allowed to make a phone call. I called Adult Protective Services to find out exactly what were Pat's rights. And uh, I didn't want to file a complaint because I had been warned if I did call APS that I would no longer be able to visit Pat. I just wanted to know legally what were his rights. But the people at Adult Protective Services on the call line are, are trained to get all that information out of you. And before I realized it, I had, you know, told all that information. I, I begged them, please don't file a complaint. They said, oh, we have to. And they had to fax a copy to the facility. And the next week, I started getting calls from the, quote, volunteer coordinator, uh, Jim DeHogue, that uh, he kept leaving me messages to call him. But I put it off because I knew what he was going to tell me until I could record him on the phone telling me that uh, I was no longer allowed to visit Pat because, quote, I made too many phone calls. So my last visit with Pat was May of 2010. So uh, a friend of mine who was a private investigator, married to a private investigator, uh, told me how I could start researching the court documents and find some information. What I found out was that this guardianship was established without notification of all of Pat's kin. Pat has a mother that is alive, a sister, brother, and father, two brothers and father that were never notified of um, the guardianship. Uh, letters were mailed to Pat's dad and one of his brothers, and they were, they're in the court file as returned to sender. Um, I had one time visited Pat and asked him about his mom, and I, I uh, asked him, Pat, where does your mom live? And he told me where his mom lived, and um, I ended up finding his mom, which was very easy. And I always say, if, if I, a stay-at-home mom, taking care of six kids, a sick husband, and a special needs child can do it, anybody could have. The lawyer that was hired by the guardian could have found Pat's mother if anybody had wanted to. And... Uh, so going through the file, the first red flag was stated that, that Pat's trust is only worth 250 grand, and it said that Pat is on Medicaid and SSI, and this, these have been paying for Pat's care. Going through the file then, I found uh, starting in 2003, where Pat's legal guardian, Mark Daney, charges his living trust almost 100 grand a year to pay for Pat's care. There is a, basically a charge for the, the Mission Road Developmental Center, and then there are various charges. Uh, Mark's uh, lawyer has paid for out of Pat's estate. So over the years, this has added up to over a million dollars been taken out of Pat's living trust. Like I said, Pat's isolated and confined. I have called every agency I know, uh, Advocacy Inc., which is a federal agency, now known as Disability Rights. Uh, the first two times, they wouldn't even take my call. The third time, uh, the, the girl taking the call said, well, um, the victim has to be the one calling in the complaint, and I told her, you didn't understand what I just said. Number one, he's not allowed to make a phone call. And number two, he does not even know y'all exist. He's over-medicated, and he's being Stockholmed. The only person he sees from the outside world is his legal guardian once a year. He thinks that legal guardian is the only person that cares for him. He thinks his legal guardian is a lawyer. And I was allowed to see Pat basically a short six-week period of time. Um, I kept notes of all my visits. 
in a journal. I, I took notes. I took pictures. Um, the facility has uh, called the court investigator at the probate court, told lies about me, uh, and those, of course, have escalated from I made too many phone calls to I fed Pat a peanut butter sandwich which endangered his life because he can't swallow, but uh, yet he can eat a hamburger and Cheetos. Um, but I never fed him a sandwich. Um, and then, of course, they reported, uh, it escalated to, there were reports that I fondled Pat. And this is, of course, the same uh, people reporting that I wouldn't watch him because I would bring my younger kids. And um, so they are, are spewing lies to the probate court. Uh, one of the lies that they have told the probate court investigator is that um, I would cause Pat two seizures every time I would visit him, which is ludicrous, and I've told the court investigator there's no medical documentation for this. But her job is to basically keep people away. The court investigator, her name is Sue Bean, and this is under uh, Bear County Probate Court Number 2, Judge Tom Rickoff. Uh, I've come to know about a little bit about the probate courts, the probate codes, and um, Judge uh, Rickoff hired his wife's best friend to be his court investigator. Sue Bean is a retired school teacher who does not have the prof proper um, uh, requirements for the job of court investigator, but her her wife, uh, his her best friend, uh, hired. Her. Her wife's best friend's husband hired her for the job, and uh, she's going to have a nice retirement package, and so will the judge. And um, so I have made appeals to the court, to the court investigator, to Adult Protective Services, to dads, and I've got nowhere. I have um, gone to the FBI, and finally, um, the Attorney General's Office Medicaid Fraud Division did an investigation and what they have found is their findings were that uh, Pat is not on Medicaid and but it looks like he's being embezzled and um, I tend to figure that um, the legal guardian Mark Daney his sister is Diane Rath, and she was the Texas Workforce Commissioner of the state of Texas. I found it appalling that she wouldn't, if she is such a loving sister to Pat Davis, that she never allowed him to work, never allowed him to vote. And uh, I suspect that they are using a false Medicaid number for Pat and a false Social Security number because it is in the court record that Pat is on Medicaid, that he's receiving SSI, that he has a living trust, and uh, the guardian has already charged it over a million dollars. To me, there's double dipping. I can't get anybody uh, to do an investigation in Bear County. Uh, Mark Daney has an arrest for possession of meth in his, uh, on the books. I was told by a former drug dealer that he got off of that charge because he became a snitch. Uh, Mark also has divorce records that are sealed by the court. He was divorced in 1999. Uh, the guardianship uh, was established in 1996. Mark's marriage was from 96 to 99, and those divorce records from that three-year marriage are sealed by the court. The last time I brought a concern to the judge, he told me that I was disingenuous and I should hire a lawyer. And um, there's no evidence that Adult Protective Service or the court has ever done a financial audit or investigation upon Mark Daney. And... Um, so I um, am a member now of a group called GRADE, which stands for Guardianship Reform Advocates for the Disabled and Elderly. 
I've been uh, visiting the Capitol, meeting with uh, legislators, meeting with a lot of uh, candidates that uh, and informing them about the exploitation in our state under the probate code of our elderly and disabled. And um, so, I'm Ione McGinty, and we want our country back.